Hey everybody, Mr. Grove here. Today we're going to talk about some of the things in Chapter 6, like energy relationships between reactants and products, and how enzymes will affect those relationships. So let's get started, and first we'll talk about metabolism. So when we think metabolism, we usually think of eating food, digesting food, um, but the process is much bigger than that. So it's really the total sum of all of an organism's chemical processes. So all of the you know reactants, products, the surpluses, the deficits of the cell. And we can kind of break that into two different things. So a catabolic and an anabolic pathways. And so catabolic pathways are when we have complex molecules that are going to break down uh, and release energy. So in cellular respiration we have complex sugars uh, and so they are going to break apart and release energy as they do so. In anabolic processes or pathways, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build complex molecules. So like photosynthesis would be an example of this. Um, one of the ways you might be able to remember this is like anabolic steroids are the steroids that we use to build muscle. And so these complex muscle proteins are anabolic and in steroids then. So just some terminology so far. Um, more terminology, so energy is the capacity to do work or make change, and there's lots of different kinds of energy. There's kinetic energy, uh, energy of motion, there's potential energy, uh, so stored energy, and there's lots of different ways we can store energy. So if you hold a ball uh, from a tower, that would be gravitational potential energy. Uh, we can have electrostatic or magnetic potential energy. Um, the one that we'll kind of concern with most it would be chemical potential energy. And so that potential energy is stored in some sort of chemical uh, reaction process. And so the study of this energy is what's called thermodynamics. Uh, and so you know, we are concerned with how energy is transferred from one reactant uh, to another uh, to make products. Uh, and so things like having a closed or open system to know if there's outside energy that's getting into it, but if not, if it's a closed system, then we know that the first law of thermodynamics stands firm, and that is sometimes referred to as the law of conservation of energy, that we can't create or destroy it, but we can change it around. So when you take the match head over here and rub that on the box, that's kinetic energy. Um, and then that's being transferred. There's also potential energy, in, chemical potential, in the match head. And so that's being transferred into the thermal heat producing and light producing energy. So we're not destroying anything, we're just kind of moving it around. Um, that one you're probably familiar with. This one's a little bit less familiar, and that's the second law of thermodynamics. And that's all energy transfers increase entropy. And so what is entropy? Entropy is the measure of disorder or randomness. So it's kind of like your room at home here. Uh, it's just going to keep getting messier and messier and more random and more random until you provide energy to reverse that entropy. And so when mom and dad yell at you and you have to clean up your room, then you're putting the energy in to reverse that entropy. Uh, and so those are uh, scientific laws, so they are, they are non-disputable, really. Um, another thing that is really tricky, but also really helpful, is Gibbs free energy. Okay, and so Gibbs free energy um, is an equation put together by Josiah Gibbs um, that talks about the relationship of whether or not a reaction will happen. Uh, whether it's spontaneous or not. And so some of the terminology in the free energy, so uh, the delta G, uh, delta is just the Greek for change in, so changing uh, free energy. So this is going to be the free energy. Uh, delta H will be the total internal energy, and sometimes we call that enthalpy. Uh, T would be temperature, and then S is going to be entropy, that measure of uh, disorder. And so typically, um, if we have a negative delta G, then that means what we're going to have is a spontaneous process. So this reaction will happen. 
Um, and so if we have a positive delta G, then it's going to be non-spontaneous. And so it's not going to happen on its own unless we add energy to force this reaction to happen. And so this is some complex uh, chemistry, a lot of physical chemistry in here. Um, and so that's why you definitely need to take a look at the Bozeman video um, that kind of explains this a little bit better um, in details. But for us, we're going to kind of skip to the end and just kind of concentrate on the delta G, whether it's negative or whether it's positive. Okay, so if we have a negative delta G, we're going to call that an exergonic, and that's sometimes referred to as an exothermic process. Okay, so a negative delta G. Uh, if we have a positive delta G, then we're going to call that an endo, endergonic or endothermic process. Uh, and that's going to give us an idea as to whether or not the reaction will happen on its own or if we have to put energy in. So in this diagram, we have reactants with less energy, products with more energy. So that means we had to put energy into that. Uh, and so this would be an endergonic or an endothermic process. Um, and so delta G would be positive. Um, and so that is going to uh, be represented by this reaction. This reaction over here, though, is going to be our reactants have more energy than our products, and so they're going to be able to release energy. Um, and so that energy gets released, uh, and that's going to be a negative delta G. Okay, so that negative delta G or that exergonic or exothermic, however you want to say that, is going to be uh, represented in this diagram here. So, um, once we've established whether or not things are going to happen uh, based on their negative or positive free energy, that uh, helps us in understanding how we have to either stop that or enhance that from happening. Um, another thing uh, is a special molecule called ATP. And so ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and we know from cellular respiration this is the gasoline that your cell runs on. This is what runs the cell. And so the making of ATP or the using of ATP is going to be a negative uh, delta G. So we know that's going to happen. So it's got a very specific kilocalorie per mole amount. And so as we use that up, we're going to release energy. So we know that's an exothermic process. But if we're going to have to reverse that to, to make that in an intergonic process, then that means we would have a positive delta G. So we'd have to supply this amount of energy per mole. Um, and that is just an example of how this, the cell is going to use this idea of delta G gives free energy in the process of making and using ATP. Um, so typically we would have a catabolic pathways Okay, so catabolic, remember, is going to use uh, or is going to use energy. So if we take a complex and we break it down, and that gives off energy, those giving off that energy then will be used to make more anabolic processes. And so it's kind of a cycle then uh, that we can do that. So we'll use energy from some reactions to make um, other reactions take place. Um, so like we said earlier, the laws of thermodynamics uh, can tell us what will happen. So if something is going to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous. But what it doesn't tell us is the speed. And so these spontaneous reactions, we don't want them to just kind of be happening all on their own without the cell telling it to happen. And so there's what's called an activation energy. And so this activation energy is like a little bump in the road that uh, keeps the reaction from just spontaneously happening with the cell not wanting to. And so we have to put a little bit of energy in to overcome this activation energy, and then the ball will kind of roll down the hill, so to speak. Um, so how do enzymes play a part? Well, we know that uh, enzymes are very shape-dependent, and they have a very specific job. You know, they're proteins, so they end in ACE. Um, and so what they're going to do is they are going to lower the activation energy. So it's, uh, they're going to bring that down. So with the enzyme would be like here in red. 
and without the enzyme would be here in black. And so it's gonna need more energy, so it, the ball doesn't roll down the hill on its own, but you know, we're here we've given it a little bit of a shove or we've taken the little pebble out that kept the ball from rolling down the hill. Uh, and so that is the process then of the enzyme. It's gonna lower that activation energy. Um, and so enzymes are very important for that. Uh, we know from uh, previous chapters that they um, work on what's called a substrate molecule. Uh, so an enzyme is very shape dependent. Uh, the substrate is very shape dependent and they will fit in at the active site. And so that active site then is where the enzyme can break that molecule down. Uh, so like in the case of sucrose, uh, we might be breaking that down into glucose and fructose. Um, but enzymes can be uh, messed up on their shape. And so that shape uh, being kind of messed up is gonna be called denaturing. And so there are different ways that an enzyme can be denatured. Uh, temperature would be one, uh, pH would be another one, salinity would be another one. Uh, and so these are all ways in which we can denature enzymes. And so enzymes usually have a sweet spot that they work best on. So like in the case of temperature, that's usually around 37 Celsius. That's what body temperature is. Um, and that's why most enzymes would in the human body would work very well at that temperature. Uh, same with pH, so there's usually kind of a sweet spot on pH um, that would allow enzymes to work best, with the exception of like the intestinal tract would have a very low pH that they would work best at. Uh, salt concentrations also affecting those as well. So uh, lots of different ways to denature enzymes. Um, and, you know, this, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. I guess it depends on, you know, if you're the organism that's getting its enzymes denatured. Um, another way is to try and block things at the active site. And so to do that, uh, we're going to use what's called an inhibitor. And so there's what's called a competitive inhibitor, which will block at the active site. And so it's kind of like uh, we're trying to stick the key into the lock here, but something is in the way. This competitive inhibitor uh, is in the way. We've poked something in, the key won't fit in there. Uh, and so that will block at the active site. A non-competitive inhibitor is going to go somewhere else on the enzyme, but that changes the shape, and so the shape doesn't fit, the sub substrate doesn't fit in the active site anymore um, because we've changed the shape with our non-competitive inhibitor. And so, again, lots of ways to, to change and, and impact the uh, effective ability of the enzyme. And so we look into a lot of pharmaceuticals and, and drugs, um, pesticides, herbicides that might try and you know, target a specific enzyme that we can either competitively block um, or non-competitively inhibit and therefore keep the substrate from uh, being activated. So um, another one last thing is going to be a feedback inhibition. And so sometimes we have a series of process. So like enzyme one will make a product and then that will be a reactant for enzyme two. And then that will be a reactant for enzyme three. That will be a reactant for enzyme four. That will be a reactant for enzyme five. And then, you know, we get to the end of the circle here and maybe that last product might actually be a, an, in, an inhibitor for one of the previous enzymes. So when we get enough of that last product together, um, that could potentially create a way to block the enzyme earlier in the process, and that would shut things down. And so this is what's called feedback inhibition. And so sometimes when the body will produce enough of one thing, it becomes an inhibitor, and then the whole process will slow down. When that wears off, then there's not enough uh, inhibitors, and so the process can start back up again. And this is just another way the body can monitor and regulate um, these enzymatic processes of the cell. So that's enzymes and energy transfers, and I hope that was helpful.